Hey, this is Dan Wunderlich from Defining Grace, and welcome to Art of the Sermon, a show for preachers, teachers, and communicators. My guest today is Kristen Soltis Anderson. She's the co-founder of the polling firm Echelon Insights. She's a political contributor to ABC World News, and she's also author of The Selfie Vote. And throwing it way back, she's one of my classmates from grade school. She's done a lot of work researching millennials specifically. And so she joins us today to talk about how to connect with emerging generations, not only how to understand them, but how to communicate with them. So here it is, my interview with my old classmate, Kristen Soltis Anderson. Well, my guest today is Kristen Soltis Anderson. She's the co-founder of Echelon Insights, a political contributor to ABC World News, as well as an author and a podcaster herself, co-host of The Pollsters. Uh, But I know her from grade school, and so I am so grateful to have Kristen Soltis Anderson with us today. How are you doing today, Kristen? I'm doing great, Dan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said, I know you from way back and have had fun following your career. But for those of our listeners who maybe don't know you as well as I do, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well as your work? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Orlando, Florida. That's where I, I met Dan in the uh, in elementary school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Went to University of Florida as well. Go Gators. Um, and then graduated and headed up to D.C. I had done a ton of, you know, the debate team in high school, had always just been really interested in politics. And so uh, moving up to D.C., you know, I wanted to work in something like speech writing or, you know, some kind of field that would focus on how do we talk to people about the ideas that we believe in? How do we motivate and persuade? Uh, And it turned out that polling was actually the perfect industry for that because the polling industry, which is where I've worked for the last 10 years, focuses on trying to study what do voters think, what do they feel, what do they want, and how can we make our leaders more responsive to that? So I started off working at a polling firm called the Winston Group. I was the spreadsheet updater, the phone <laughs> answerer, you know, the yeah. low, lowest on the rung on the totem pole, and kind of learned the trade of polling and campaigns from that viewpoint. So a lot of folks, when they want to work in politics, the first step is you go work on a campaign. And that's that's honestly the best step to take is go out, work in the field, knock on those doors, learn how it works at the ground level. I kind of got into it from a, a weird angle by starting out at a consultancy. I worked at the Winston Group for about eight years and then uh, took some time off to work on my book. It's called The Selfie Vote. Um, I'd been, I, I went to grad school while I was in D.C. and was studying younger voters and in particular why they were breaking away from the GOP and then turned that kind of into a book after the 2012 election. So it took a little time to do that, did a fellowship up at Harvard University at their Institute of Politics, and then launched my own firm, Echelon Insights, which is where I work today. And we uh, we try to study what voters are thinking, how elections might turn out, and we try to do it in new ways since we know that a lot of the old polling methods are becoming less and less accurate which with every passing day. Yeah, I am a follower of your firm's Twitter account, and it's always interesting because y'all's take on what's going on either during a, a debate or on a primary day and certainly coming up on election day, the insights you all have and the things that you're listening to seem to be slightly different than what everyone else is listening to. And so it always makes a really interesting addition to all of the coverage that people can follow on days like that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we really try to help people get their minds outside of the bubble. If you're living in Washington or New York, there's this like I, I, there's just this bubble that lives around you where, you know, everybody kind of thinks like you and most people come from the same sort of backgrounds and and it's easy to get caught up in assuming that that's reality and that's what voters are thinking about and talking about. And so we try to keep things focused sort of outwardly and try to use a lot of new tools to listen to what activists outside the Beltway are saying, or voters in particular key swing states. You know, we really focus on listening outside the bubble rather than inside the bubble. And you do listening not just in the field of politics, but some of your clients are also in the world of business. And so you've spent a lot of time in many different contexts researching, especially younger folks, millennial generation and their perspectives and what they want out of life. And so I was wondering, for all of the pastors and churches out there that are, that are, are kind of still wanting to figure out how to understand millennials and how to connect with them, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of how you understand uh, the millennial generation and how has the research you've done confirmed or even defied some of the stereotypes of the generation? Sure. Well, I think that, you know, millennials are generally pretty down about the label millennial and their own generation. The Pew Research Center did a great study where they asked people 
Um, you know, what generation do you identify with? And only about 40% of people who are actually millennials <laughs> really identify as millennials, but yeah. the rest identify as like Gen Xers or something else, or they don't know. So the label millennial is, is off putting. And part of it is because like when I go into focus groups and I ask people, what do you think of when you think of the word millennial? And I'm asking younger people, they'll say, well, we're more open-minded. We're more sort of aware of other ways of living and other cultures. And we're pretty connected and savvy with social media. But then from there, it like devolves into really negative things. Sure. We're entitled, we're self-absorbed, you know, on and on. And then when I'll say, well, do you think that's an accurate portrayal? They'll always say, no, no, no. I think that that's sort of an inaccurate view. Um, I think that people think we're not patriotic, not hardworking, just expect everything to be handed to us, et cetera. But actually, we really want to make a difference. We're just frustrated with the sort of older or traditional ways of doing so. Um, so I go around the country a lot giving speeches to, you know, company retreats and things like that. And I try to boil the millennial mindset into about four different key points. And, and bear in mind, there are 80 million people in sure. America that are millennials. So it's re I always hesitate to like paint with such a broad, you know, brush and say, Oh, all millennials think this way. But I mean, these really are threads that throughout all of my research, I have seen kind of sum things up. Uh, there's, uh, there's a sort of a, a desire to focus on, um, taking care of others. Uh, I've taken a look at a lot of polling about what millennials think is uh, morally right or morally unacceptable. And in general, they're very much of the mind that if you are hurting someone, that that's wrong. But if no one's being hurt, if there's no perceived victim of an action, then it is morally acceptable, which which sort of means that in many cases, you know, you have millennials more willing to take stands on things like animal cruelty, you know, things like marital fidelity, much more concerned about that. But then on the other hand, there are other things where I know the church, you know, churches have kind of struggled with how to deal with, um, where millennials are much more sort of accepting than older generations. So uh, one, that question of if it's not hurting anybody, is it wrong? I think is core to how most millennials think about morality. Mm. The second thing that I think stands out is an aversion to big commitments or a sort of a distrust of institutions we were told to trust. Yeah. If you think about it, if you were growing up in, you know, the 80s or 90s, what was the advice that you probably got from your parents? You probably got told, well, it's good to go to college, get a degree, you know, work hard, um, you know, get married, settle down, buy a house. That's a responsible decision. Make sure you're setting aside money to invest in the stock market. Well, if you came of age then around 2008, what did the landscape look like for you? You saw your parents' generation experiencing record levels of divorce. Uh, you saw the financial crisis make the house down the block go into foreclosure and your parents' 401k evaporated. Um, and then if you did go to college, maybe you graduated, but you had a lot of debt and then you didn't get the job that you necessarily thought you should have gotten with that degree. So all of these things that you were told, oh, if you do this, this is playing by the rules. Things will turn out okay if you play by the rules. There are a lot of the foundation of that was pretty shaken. And so whether it's things like the institution of marriage or things like, you know, institutions like the church, like political parties, like the police, um, lots of things that we've sort of always been told we should trust or look up to, a lot of that's been shaken and particularly shaken for millennials. The third thing that I think is important is that for millennials don't like labels, which I, we, you know, <laughs> right. we just, we just went over millennials don't like the label millennial. Um, but, but I think it, it spans to a whole bunch of different types of labels. So within, um, the realm of faith and religion, you know, I'll see in polling data, shockingly high numbers of young people saying that they don't identify with a particular religious tradition, but they're just as likely as their peers were 20 or 30 years ago when they were young to say that they pray daily. They're just as likely to say that they consider themselves people of faith, um, that their faith is very important to them. But for some reason, religion and faith have been separated. And so religion, it seems like, well, gosh, that means I'm signing up for a label that comes with all this baggage. And, yeah. you know, so it's, I mean, I, I know, you know, there's the phrase cafeteria Catholic, you know, you just want to pick <laughs> yeah. and choose yeah. pieces of, of the faith. That that I think is how a lot of, of millennials are thinking of things, that they believe that they're very faithful 
Um, I, there was at one point when I was writing the book, I took a look at, I found polling data about Tim Tebow and younger people were more likely than older people to ascribe Tim Tebow's success to, uh, to divine intervention. (laughs) (laughs) It was just sort of a funny poll poll number that I, I found, but, um, you know, so young people are willing to say that they're people of faith and that they pray daily, but they're less likely to do things like attend church regularly or, affiliate with a particular religious tradition. And this isn't just about religion. I mean, I'll find that young people are hold views that are considered environmental. Um, they're pretty green in their viewpoint of the world and their belief that we should do something about climate change. And, um, but at the same time, they are the least likely generation to call themselves environmentalists, that right. that label seems like it has a bunch of political baggage with it. Um, and then I think the last but not least, I think millennials are really focused on being pragmatic and trying to just do what works. And if something doesn't work, why would you keep doing it? Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, the way that that they run is this sort of iterate, try something out, and if it fails, then fail fast and move on to something else. And let's just do what works. Let's not let our gut necessarily guide us. If something's working, great. If it's not, try something new. And, you know, there's this radical transparency and accountability now where I can get data about whether a product works or doesn't, whether a restaurant is good or bad. It's all right at my fingertips. Um, and so there's an expectation that things should work that way. And I think this really shapes the the view of how how millennials view government in that it is less about big or small government, sort of the old ideological debates that the baby boomers love to have. But it's more about are we doing stuff that works? Are we doing stuff that takes care of others? And if we're not, how can we move in that direction? And if it's more government, that's fine. But if it's uh, institutions of civil society, if it's relying on churches or nonprofits, that's great. And if it means relying on individuals or businesses, that's fine too. Let's just do whatever works. It's interesting how there's this extreme tension between our individuality. We don't want to be lumped in with a group. Like even we millennials who know we're millennials don't want to be called that because of the negative stereotypes of it. But yet at the same time, we have this passion for helping other people and, or at the very least for averting harm for other people. And so there's this like dynamic tension there where, you know, we don't want to be a part of a church or a political party or denomination because of all the baggage that comes with it. But we also don't live our lives as isolated and disconnected as the negative stereotype uh, leads us to be. I would imagine that's probably one of the big cultural shifts that organizations and institutions like political parties and maybe the church are, are, are slow to pick up. Well, and one of the the things that I think, you know, an institution like the, the church could learn from is like when I, I do a lot of work with the college Republican. And so if you want to talk about a group that is trying really hard to attract young people and sometimes in an environment where what they stand for is not always in vogue, um, I mean, that's, that, that is a great example. Yeah. And one of the things that I found is that you know, on certain campuses, both the college Republicans and the college Democrats, um, you know, in places where they're kind of struggling to gain members, they're finding that lots of people are instead choosing to join issue specific action groups. Mm. So instead of joining the college Democrats, they're joining campus climate action, or instead of joining the college Republicans, they're joining a group that's just focused on dealing with the national debt or campus right to life. So there are, I I think, you know, if you are a a church and you're looking to bring in more young people, I mean, talk about the things that are a piece of your mission and sort of the issues and things that you stand for and the impact that you want to make in the world. And I think that's a strong way to bring people in that, you know, tradition and labels and institutions are less interesting than what is it that you're doing to change the world? And what's the, what's the thing that I'm having an impact on by showing up every Sunday or showing up to these meetings or contributing my, my time, talents, and resources? Um, these are, I, I think that's the, definitely the approach that I would suspect would resonate best. Exactly. When, and, and how can we play a role? Because I think yeah. there's this, this we, we live in a culture where everything is on demand. We can, we can do things. Technology has allowed us to become so much more active that we don't want to just go and watch someone else do it or go and contribute to an organization financially and then not be able to be involved. And, and you talk there about uh, 
being able to communicate this. And of course, that is a huge challenge because the way that we communicate and connect with one another is shifting and changing. And I was wondering if you have any ideas about key tools or approaches that institutions or even individuals and individual organizations can take advantage of uh, to reach and communicate with emerging generations. Sure. So I always hesitate to be too platform specific because, you know, I could say today that like (laughs) Snapchat is growing at this insane pace and that's where most young people are at. And, but then like a year from now, you know, this episode could be really outdated right. because something new has been invented. But well, generally, and, and as soon as the organizations get on it, they want to go somewhere else. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, that's that was that's sort of what happened a little bit with Facebook, yeah. where, you know, for I, I remember joining Facebook my sophomore year of college, right when it first launched and became available to people at UF. And, right. Um, you know, it was only about five or six years later that all of a sudden my mom and grandpa were on Facebook, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is great. I, I love it now because I can share pictures with them, but I'm also 32. And so the idea of being on the same platform as my mom or grandma does not turn me off. Whereas I can see somebody being 20, 21 years old yeah. and being like, uh, I don't think I want to be on Facebook because my parents are on here. Exactly. Um, so, you know, there are, there's always, I think looking at what younger people are doing is valuable because it shows you where things are headed. And I think right now, Snapchat and platforms that are really heavy on video are huge. Um, so, you know, Instagram has been around for a while, but I think Instagram has really kind of come into its own and now has a feature that sort of functions like Snapchat, but without kind of the stigma of Snapchat. I mean, I'm, you know, when Snapchat right. first came out, of course, it had the stigma of like, well, why would you want pictures that disappear so quickly? <laughs> what are you trying to hide? Yeah. Um, you know, and so so Instagram stories kind of functions the same way as Snapchat stories. It's a way for you to broadcast, you know, not particularly well edited or highly produced uh, short video clips about kind of what's going on in your day. And then they just automatically cycle out after 24 hours. You know, it's not like, there, you know, oh, it, it expires It's upon reading, you know, it's not that kind of thing. Um, but it's just a way for you to sort of constantly tell the story of what you're up to. And um, so there are a lot of, I think, celebrities and brands that are really trying to get good about using it. But Snapchat is, I think, still the major platform. If you don't already use Snapchat, it can be very hard to kind of wrap your head around. Yeah, <laughs> the, exactly. The interface is not very intuitive, but it is, it is a platform where lots of folks are. I think the other challenge about Snapchat is, how do you build a following from scratch? I think it's easier on platforms like Twitter or Facebook or even Instagram for people to discover you and come find your message by, you know, if they like things that are similar to you or are part of your network, it's easier to stumble upon them. Whereas I have not found Snapchat to be as friendly with that. Right. Um, but I think the overall lesson here is mobile video, number one, and two, Stuff that's not really well produced, but that gives an authentic glimpse into what's going on. Um, that makes you kind of feel like you are there and are a part of what's going on in the poster's life. Um, I think authenticity is so important. Whenever I'm you know, talking to people about what is it that made Bernie Sanders so appealing to so many young people in the primary, I always point out that you know before Bernie Sanders, there was Ron Paul. And that both of them, the appeal was not that they were slick well-produced candidates, <laughs> right. um, who were, who were cool. And, you know, instead it was that they just had a message that you, you honestly believed was a real look into their heart and soul and what they stood for. And that in and of itself is appealing, even if you don't a hundred percent agree with the positions that they hold. And so, you know, I think that I know it's hard to say like, be authentic because that's kind of an, an <laughs> <laughs> right, right. creates its own paradox. How yeah. do you, how do you, you can't force authenticity, but I, I do think that that is a really key attribute, no matter what platform you're using. Well, and, and I think it's not necessarily that we have to try to be authentic, but there are certainly sometimes steps we take that erode authenticity. And some of it is the cleanup or the writing of the script or getting the lighting just a little too late, you know, harping on the details that make it look slick and produced rather than making it seem like a true window into what we're doing. But even with, uh, you know, Snapchat and Twitter, everything seems to be down to the soundbite culture and the tweetable, memorable um, phrase, but yet you still have to say something that has, you know, consequence and depth and substance to it. And I would imagine no one is more experienced with this uh, than you are because you have sat on panels on television and on uh, internet broadcasts for ABC World News where you do all of this research, uh, you, you know, whittle 
down these core ideas and they come to you and say, what do you think, Kristen? And you have like 30 seconds, 60 seconds before someone else starts talking over you. What is your process for distilling down the immense amount of research and preparation and thinking that you do to fit sort of this soundbite culture? Well, one of the things that I am lucky to have at my disposal is data, which uh, you would think data actually should make things more complicated, right? Everybody sort of gets scared of numbers, and um, but I actually find it's very clarifying for me. I go through about once a week and I look at all of the, the new data that's out about what's going on in politics. And I'll write out, you know, a whole bunch of different, I don't want to, not even full paragraphs, but just sort of blurbs about things that I think are interesting and might be relevant. And then I just sort of force myself, like, are there are there six to eight words I can cut out of this paragraph? Are there six mm-hmm. to eight words I can cut out of this paragraph? Um, and, and gradually over time, I just learned, I, I tried to learn how to get rid, eliminate what is extraneous. So I, I, early, early on when I started doing this, I was lucky enough to go to a media trainer and, um, she, you know, we watched clips of me doing some of these segments. And there are things that I would say in a TV segment where she'd say, okay, you could have cut that whole first sentence out and your point still would have stood. You know, I would get, a, so take, for instance, earlier in this show today, when I was talking about, um, you know, Pew Research Center put out a study where they showed that four out of 10 millennials uh, don't even identify as millennials. She would say, like, you can actually just cut out the part where you say the Pew Research Center put out a new study because, you know, if people really want to know, they can come to you and you can point them to the source. Or you can put put that at the end of your sentence so that you're not losing people in the first six words. I mean, so it's things like that. And then just over time, practicing, how can I take the essence of all of this data and find the common thread that links it all together and then put that front and center? Put your thesis statement out there and then put your supporting information behind it rather than here are my three supporting points that then build up to my thesis. I had to make sure that I was always putting, put the headline first, don't bury the lead was, was a really important lesson to learn. Yeah. And that's, I, I was in the journalism college at UF and my degrees in advertising, but I still had to take some journalism uh, classes and they always talk about put that, put that sentence first. It's almost like you can read new stories with just the first sentence of each paragraph and you should be able to pick up what's going on. Yep. Well, I, I wanted to ask you sort of a, um, A theoretical tone, hopeful question. This episode will go out uh, five days before the election here in the United States, uh, and it follows one of the most contentious and honestly depressing campaigns in recent history. And so as someone who lives inside that bubble, lives in Washington, D.C., you work in the world of politics, you have relationships with people all over the ideological spectrum. I was wondering, is there anything that gives you hope uh, that you see in your work or that you see in the people that you work with that you can use to reassure us that kind of no matter what happens, uh, you know, we're going to keep surviving. We're going to go on because because there's something to be hopeful about. Sure. Well, I, I think, you know, this has been a pretty depressing election. You know, when I look at the polls, I see overwhelming numbers of voters who say that they're frustrated, that they're angry and that they're not sure that either of these candidates is the right answer to solve any of those problems. Um, But I have been particularly, uh, I I always feel uplifted when I am talking to younger voters in focus groups outside of Washington, because for all of the sort of frustration and anxiety that they feel, um, there's a real belief that we may have to just wait our turn as a generation to get in and fix a lot of stuff. But once, when it's our turn, we're committed to doing it, that there's, there's not a that there's a sense of, of disconnection from the political process today and a sense that politics as it stands is just not working for us, but that in no way has diminished the desire of people to see change and to solve problems and mm. to, to think that, that somewhere down the road, our generation is going to be able to fix things, that, that there's a belief that a lot of the, the angst and division and anger that we're seeing in this election is is coming from an older era that, you know, if you think about it, in some ways, both candidates have a message that kind of wants to reclaim something lost in the past. And with that has come some things that younger voters aren't crazy about or that Mm. don't really match up with our values, but that there is a belief that ultimately things are moving. Things will move in a, a, a good direction, particularly when our generation gets more of a grasp on the sort of reins of power. And so I'm hopeful that you know, for younger people that are, that do look at this election and do feel frustrated, just know that, that this is not how it always has to be. 
um, that every election is new and that this, this election may well be the last gasp of some things that are sort of frustrating and ugly and broken. And, and if you think about, you know, the way, think about the way an earthquake works, right? You have a fault line where there's just been tension and pressure building up and building up and building up. And eventually something slips and it moves to a new position where suddenly it, it's calm and, and we're in a new normal. And we may be in the mode right now where there, that tension is just built up and built up and built up and things are about to slip. Hmm. Um, and that, that eventually voters will just say, I've had enough of the way things are going of elections like the one we've just seen. And it, it may take that fever to kind of finally purge us of some of the bad stuff that has been sickening our politics for a while. Sure. Absolutely. Well, we have a set of questions that we like to ask all of our, our guests, and, and I've adapted them for you. And the first one is, who have been some of the most impactful communicators in your life and, and why? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I I always remember, um, I, I remember it, when I was in high school debate, first uh, sort of being exposed to great speakers and, you know, watching inspiring speeches. And so it may seem like a, a cliche to say, uh, JFK and Ronald Reagan, but sure. really, I mean, these are presidents from, from both parties who were able to give an optimist, an optimistic vision of the future. And despite being, you know, ideological, certainly having a, a, a point of view that, that is, that was partisan, we're able to sort of transcend that and invite people of other points of view to come along for the ride and be inspired by the vision that they had for America. And so I've, I've always been a fan of theirs. Um, I'm also a big Margaret Thatcher fan. And so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when I'm feeling down, I'll just go on YouTube and watch prime minister's questions, <laughs> uh, question time in parliament where, uh, you know, she would get grilled by members of the other party and her responses were always, so sharp and so smart and, but, but never, you know, certainly never dull, but I think always with a, a little, I, I always perceive them as having a little bit of a smile to them. Mm. Um, sort of a little bit of a, yes, we are sparring intellectually, but you know, it, it's, it's, I'm never going to take it personally. Um, I'm just, you know, excited to be here for the debate of ideas. So I've always loved watching sort of her engage and communicate in that format. That's awesome. Well, and certainly I encourage our listeners to check out your book, The Selfie Vote, your podcast, The Pollsters, and uh, both your personal Twitter account and Echelon Insights Twitter accounts. But are there any other resources that you might recommend for folks who uh, would like to stay on top of all that's going on in uh, your world? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, the I, I think one of the resources that I find to be incredibly valuable are some of these data journalism websites that have popped up. So there's a writer, his name is Nate Cohn, and he writes at the New York Times, the Upshot blog. And they, I think, do a wonderful job of taking a lot of data about what's moving people, you know, how might elections turn out? What do people think about different issues? Um, and, and trying to distill that down into beautiful charts or graphs or things that are really consumable. Uh, there's also 538, which is part of the ESPN, ABC, Disney right. yep. world. Uh, it's where Nate Silver writes. And I think they do a good job as well. And their topics go beyond just politics. They do a lot of stuff in entertainment and consumer culture. But both of those are, are sites that I always sort of nudge people toward. Um, and then the last but not least, I'm a big fan of a site called The Federalist. It's it's certainly a right of center site, but it's not. I I don't think of it as explicitly Republican or or even necessarily political. It's it, they talk a lot about culture, so I, I don't agree with every writer on there, but sure. I, I think they have a sort of a fresher take on a lot of things, and they have a podcast called the Federalist Radio Hour that my friends Mary Catherine Ham and Ben Dominich host. It's it's an excellent, I think, daily, hour-long podcast. Wow. Um, but I, I always enjoy the stuff that they have to say. That's awesome. And, of course, you can check that out on your train up to New York. We uh, have to let you go here because you are. <laughs> this is we're recording this on the day of the VP debate, and you're uh, getting on the train to head to New York for all the coverage. Uh, but for just a couple days after this episode comes out, it is Election Day. And where can listeners tune in uh, or check you out online if they'd like to follow your work on Election Night? And then, in general, how might uh, folks follow your work? work and get in touch if they want to say hi. Well, I will be on, I'm part of ABC's election night political coverage. So if you, if this is coming out five days before the election, that means on Sunday, 
uh, before you head to church or maybe DVR it and after you get home. Um, I'll be on this week, which is ABC's Sunday political talk show with George Stephanopoulos. Uh, and then on election night, tune into ABC, where I'll be with George, Koki Roberts, their whole crew, uh, breaking down the election returns as they come in. Also, you can subscribe to the Pollsters podcast, which every week um, I am the Republican and my co-host Margie is the Democrat. We take a, a sort of bipartisan look at all of the polls. And so, you know, you can listen to our most recent episode. We'll give you we'll have given you a take on what we think is going to happen on Election Day and how things are shaping up. Um, or just follow me on Twitter. I'm at K. Soltis Anderson. And I'm also on Instagram, but I'm much less political on Instagram. <laughs> so that may be a feature or a bug, depending on your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. It's really good to reconnect with you. And uh, thank you for all the work that you do. Of course. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Art of the Sermon. You can find show notes, including links to some of the things that we talked about at artofthesermon.com. As always, I would love to hear what you think about the show, and I want your input to be a part of the conversation. So you can connect with me through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, all at username Art of the Sermon. If you'd like to support the show, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast app so that new episodes are downloaded as soon as they're live. And of course, in addition to sharing the show with your friends, the best way to help us out is to leave a review in the iTunes store. This lets iTunes know that you care about the show and want other people to find it. Thank you again so much for joining me, and I'll catch you next time on Art of the Sermon.